What's up, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Falcons Final Whistle Podcast. I'm Scott Baer, and alongside me, Chris Rim and Tori McElhaney. They are actually in Santa Clara. I'm back in the ATL, but all three of us covered what was surely a disappointing game for the Falcons, a 31-13 to loss to the San Francisco 49ers at Levi Stadium that, and this is no exaggeration, severely hinders their playoff hopes. Uh, if you trust the good people over at 538.com, a victory over the 49ers could have lofted the odds of making the playoffs to around 42%. A loss to the 49ers drops it down to 2%. Huge swing, um, huge loss, but the Falcons still have three games left. Uh, Tori, let's start with you. What was your biggest takeaway? Where do you think that things went wrong uh, out there in Santa Clara? It, it's almost kind of easier to say like where things went right, because I feel like the things that went right were significantly less than the things that went wrong. Um, and, and I say that just kind of being just having watched that game to kind of go through it and to be as like disappointed as I was and and having been able to see the progress that the Falcons had made over the course of the last like three ish weeks. And then to come out and have this performance in a game where it really, really mattered in terms of what happens after the season um, in the postseason. I, I think that was kind of my biggest takeaways, which is kind of like the the frustration that you feel from it. And Chris, uh, what what stuck what stuck out uh, to you, if I can say that phrase correctly, what uh, stuck out to you from this one? Yeah, I think it was that really just that first the, the start of the game. The game started out with seeming seeming like things were going to go really, really well. Um, you, you have that turnover on, on the kick return, and then um, things just went downhill from there. And also, I still have the image of uh, Matt Ryan, like, looking so frustrated on the field, the most frustrated it seemed like he has ever looked. Um, I think he yelled at an old lineman at one point. He was going back and forth with coaches on the sideline, trying to figure out what play they were calling, called a timeout. It just seemed like everything went wrong today. Um, for the Falcons that that you know, go wrong in, in a sense. And we are going to break all of this down, exactly what happened in this game. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the, the Falcons' troubles in the red zone and really within the 10-yard line. We're going to talk about their playoff hopes, which have been hindered significantly. We are going to talk about Russ Gage coming through yet again. And as we always do in the fourth quarter, we are going to look ahead to what the Falcons have coming up next. But before we do that, a big thank you to our sponsor, Microsoft Windows 11, the official operating system of the NFL and the Atlanta Falcons. The all new Windows 11 is here to bring you closer to what you love, like this Falcons Final Whistle podcast. Learn all about the awesome new features of Windows 11 at windows.com. We're going to start the first quarter with five minutes talking about what happened to the Falcons inside the red zone, really inside the 10, where they left they got inside the San Francisco 10 yard line three times. They came away with zero points. I can't believe that statement is true. I have absolutely no idea how, especially because we're talking about more than one scenario where ultimately they had to get a yard to cross the goal line and weren't able to do it. That's how this game started. Just as uh, Chris was talking about in the intro, uh, they had, they blew a golden opportunity there. They went for it on fourth down two other times and were not able to score Head coach Arthur Smith said that was the difference in the game. Tori, do you agree with that statement, yes or no? Yes, I do. I do agree with that because you can't look at this game and look at the lack of production inside the red zone and, and not kind of look at it as a reason why the game ended up how it ended up. I mean, I just don't really have like a lot to say about it because I feel like this has happened a few times now. It's happened in a few games where the Falcons have gotten in the red zone and been unable – to punch it in and I, I think Matt Ryan said it best after the game where he's like the good teams do that and the teams that are competitive do that and the Falcons have not done that on a few occasions where it really really mattered that they did uh, so so that to me is it, it's just really frustrating I, I feel like I'm at I think this game was as frustrating to watch as um, some uh, as, as like someone who covers this team having seen like kind of like what I was talking about at the top, having seen improvement and then to kind of almost feel like this was a step back. Um, I think that was, it just made this game a, a bit frustrating to watch. Chris, uh, let's go back to that, to that very first 
sequence where the where the 49ers fumble the kickoff return and then and then the Falcons get it they they go right down um to the goal line what was the what was the sense in the stadium and and how much of an impact do you think that one had yes there was a lot of football left to uh, to a play but but for the Falcons to have gotten that big break and gotten nothing out of it how big was that and what was the uh, the uh, vibe like to uh, start the game in the stadium yeah, yeah, well, I think um, in the in the stadium, I think the the crowd was silent when when you start off a game with a fumble. That silence is, you know, an excited San Francisco, you know, 49ers crowd. There are people screaming and do it. God, you might know this stuff because you're familiar, but they're doing like this 49ers thing that I've never heard before. But they were pretty ramped up and excited about this game because it meant as much for them as it did for the Falcons, really. And and so for the game to start that way, they're automatically morale is low and the Falcons are high. And I think like we talked about, you know, momentum matters, um, you know, stuff that's not always in the stat sheet and points matter. So I think that play would have gave the, the Falcons a big momentum boost. And no, I don't know if they would have won the game or if that would have changed the final score, but I think it definitely would have gave them a, you know, some more pep in their step, some more, you know, excitement, some more, just feeling a lot better. Um, and I think, you know, it sucks because um, Cordero CP scored and then it was taken off. So um, and, you know, whether the review, however you think it went at the end of the day, it was taken off. And then um, like like we always say all the time, you don't you don't want to, you know, play coach after the game. And obviously hindsight is is 2020. But, you know, uh, Arthur Smith, as he said in the press conference post game, you know, we ran the ball that play. And then we tried to run it again. And, you know, we. We tried to do different plays and play action to make things work. And ultimately it didn't work on, but I just thought that was a monumental thing. Monumental way to start the game and, and just a negative way to start the game for the team. Yeah. But it was crazy. After that fumble, I thought, I mean, maybe there's a chance here, right. That, that, that even though that the 49ers look better on paper and they're playing at home and they've been pretty hot lately, I just thought that those types of ways catching breaks and taking advantage of them, that those are ways that that the Falcons co can go out and steal one. And I thought that there was a real opportunity there to, to come away with that with literally no points, I thought was a huge deal. Um, and then to have them move the ball down the field and be in those positions later on to, to come out of that with zero and, and, and zero, really it kind of takes the wind um, out, of, out of a team's sails, uh, you know, and I really think that ultimately they were hindered by those moments. Now they still had to go play defense. Right. And they didn't do a lot of that. And, and we're going to get into that, uh, you know, uh, down the road, but you know, I really do think though, that, that they had an opportunity to go out there to, to assert themselves, to set the tone and they weren't able to, to, uh, ultimately do that. Now we're in quarter number two, and we're going to talk about the playoff opportunity that was there that has slipped away. Now, Arthur Smith was very quick to bring up in his post-game press conference that they have not been mathematically eliminated from playoff contention. That point is true, but it now becomes unrealistic, improbable, even if it's not impossible yet, the Falcons would have to win out and then have to get like, like win the Powerball lucky um, at this point for them to be able to find their way to a postseason. It makes sense for the postseason to still be a motivating factor for these guys. They never say die. That's very on brand for them, but they also didn't make any uh, mistake uh, about the fact that this was a huge game with massive playoff implications. If they would have won, we'd be talking and they'd be in the number six, the NFC's number six seed right now. That's obviously not the case. Huge swing. Um, Tori, is it even fair to, to, to talk about the, um, the uh, postseason here, kind of where do you stand um, on, on, on all that after what is a significant setback for their playoff hopes? Yeah, I think uh, when I think about what this season was kind of heading into it, I remember saying if the Falcons could just be around 500, and I've probably said this on the podcast too, but like if the Falcons could be around 500, then that's a win for this organization and where they are right now. And I still believe that. Did I think that we were even going to be talking about playoffs this year? I, I don't think so. I don't no. think that I went into this season being like, yeah, the Falcons, like when we get into week 15, like we're going to be talking about the Falcons being a playoff team. I don't think I ever said that in, in any time, any point in time in the preseason. And so the fact that like 
you know, I know there's no moral victories or anything like that, but the fact that we were able to kind of have this conversation over the course of the last couple of weeks, I think is a good sign of kind of the progress that we've seen from the Falcons, even though I, I even said, you know, that this was a frustrating loss because it, it didn't show that progress. Um, but I, I do still hold on to and believe in what like Matt Ryan said back in like September after they started out with a few losses. And he said, I think we're going to be a very different team in November and December than we are right now. And I think we've seen that happen. Um, and, and I think in my opinion, they took a step back tonight, but they did so against a team that I think really played into those weaknesses. And I, I think it showed, cause I think every time that you see the Falcons kind of lose a game like this, it's because the other team has certain aspects of whether it's pass rush or um, just like offensive weapons that can hurt the Falcons. I mean, they, it, there's always kind of something on paper that makes sense why there was a loss and why sure. it kind of turned out the way that it did. And so I, I know that doesn't answer necessarily the question of like playoffs, but that's just kind of something that I've been thinking about. If like, if you're looking at all the teams that the Falcons have lost to and the teams that they've beat, there's kind of a like comparison. And I, I feel like at, at this point in time, it's, it's like, I think they're exactly where, where you would kind of think that they would be at this point in the season. And honestly, probably a little better than I think a lot of people thought they would be. Yeah. And the, the Falcons are playing meaningful football and Christmas is next week that, that they, that they kept this season alive and it's still technically alive. Obviously they have not been mathematically um, eliminated, but they've been playing meaningful December football when I think a lot of people wouldn't have expected that. And I think that's because, like I said before, like they're scrappers. They, they, they find ways to win. They find ways to overcome some of their uh, deficiencies and flaws, and they beat who you're supposed to beat. And I've always said that getting to the playoffs is about beating who you're supposed to beat and going 500 against everybody else. They have not gone 500 against everybody else. It's been feast or famine. They feast on, on the lower tier teams. They've struggled. They, they, they still haven't beaten a team with a winning record yet. I think that's a sign of where the Falcons are in terms of their progress, right? Because they, clearly they're better than a lot of teams. That's a step in the right direction and good for the first year of this Arthur Smith and Terry Fontenot um, enterprise. So, but do I think that they're maybe ahead of what I had expected? Possibly. But, but Chris, where do you stand on all this? I mean, it, like it has been playoff talk. Does that really have to kind of go away at this point? Um, how do you feel about that? I mean, I, I think I, I don't know if playoff talk should go away necessarily or I, I don't really know. I, I think the, the talk should just be about winning games. I think mm -hmm. what you touched on is this team is a lot further than I think what most predicted them to be at this point. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. You know, they were here. They had an opportunity to make something happen. And, you know, the guys in the locker room don't really care that they're doing better than what they were supposed to do. They probably want to get into the playoffs. Mm -hmm. So I think, I, I think the, I think the conversation can, should just be about winning games and, you know, the Falcons don't control their own destiny at this point. So I think all they could do is just focus on winning these, these last few games. And we're going to spend five or so minutes of quarter number three, talking about Russell Gage, who has turned it on. He had eight catches for 91 yards and a touchdown where he absolutely mossed. Uh, Ambry Thomas just straight up went up and got it. And that's really been the continuation of a trend for the, um, for the impending free agent and Falcons uh, wide receiver, who's become the team's most consistent uh, wide out to this point, the, the, the most consistent passing threat. He's always been good on third down. He's been really good on third down. And uh, I, I guess, Tori, why do you think that Russell Gage has kind of surged over the course of the last month? And how, how big has it been uh, for the Falcons to see him kind of turn it on? I think it's funny because I don't really know like the reason for the resurgence. Like, I, I, I don't think like there's one thing that I can kind of point out to be like, oh, he's doing this differently or Matt Ryan's doing this differently. I, 
you know, for a couple of weeks, I thought because the run game had been established and established well, that it was really kind of helping Russell Gage and Kyle Pitts, et cetera, et cetera. It was helping balance the offense a little bit more to free them up. Um, but today that wasn't the case. The run game wasn't established at all. Um, and, and Russell Gage was still able to make some big plays. So was Kyle Pitts. Um, but I think with Russell Gage particularly, I think that he kind of just stepped into the role that he needed to, uh, without Calvin Ridley out there and, and kind of with Kyle Pitts playing a different role, almost like day to like week to week because defenses play him so differently. Um, I think that it kind of took some time for one Russell to get healthy because I think that was something that we kind of overlook is that high ankle sprain and how much maybe that impacted him early in the season. I think he even kind of talked about how much he hated that high ankle sprain and how pesky it was. He'd never had one before. And he was like, I don't like it. Um, (laughs) Which who would, Um, but, but I think like kind of looking at how it was almost like a slow burn and we kind of got to this point, maybe a few weeks ago, maybe even a month ago where, it just started clicking and it started working and the connection was there. The timing was there. I think that kind of, I don't know if it's the one thing that's kind of caused this for, for Russ, but I think it's just really, really good to see at this point in his career with where he is on a contract year um, to kind of be leading this receiver core in a time that, you know, you don't have who you thought was going to be your number one. Chris, you, you wrote about Russ for the website. Uh, what was your, uh, you know, kind of uh, takeaway, your, your thesis statement of the story, if you will? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think my, my thesis, <laughs> my, the premise, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what I'm pre- talking about anymore. It's late. <laughs> I think the premise of my story was just that, you know, I thought Gage and Kyle Pitts were like the bright, the long bright spots of today. Um, I thought they both made plays uh, Kyle, like later in the game and engaged throughout. But I think Gage's um, stretch of games have come because of a lot of what Matt talked about earlier in the season. And sometimes, you know, players say things and sometimes you think, you know, is that really true? Or, you know, did, is he really looking for this guy or is he just telling us this? But what, what Matt said oftentimes when Gage had those games where he would have no targets or two targets um, or, or, or no catches at all. Um, and, and he would say, you know, the ball is going to find you, the ball will find him. Like, it's just a game by game thing. And I think now the not only is the ball finding him, but I think today showed that Matt has confidence in him because you don't just throw a 50, 50 ball to a guy who you don't have confidence in because that's it's a 50, 50 ball for a reason. Like it's going to go one way or the other way. <laughs> so uh, having the confidence to throw a 50, 50 ball to gauge who, you know, is, is a route running receiver. He's not, he's not really known as a guy who's going to go up and, and moss you, um, <laughs> which he a post game, but he did it. Um, and I think um, that's a sign of their trust and their relationship and being comfortable throughout the season. And I think, you know, two games ago, he had the best game of his career in terms of he had career best in receptions and a career best in yards. So I think the, the ball is finding him and also Matt trusts him, which is important. Yeah, and I, I think it's if he continues playing like this throughout throughout the course of this season, he's established a pretty nice little market for himself. He's a trusted third down guy. He could get paid, and it could be a very interesting storyline to follow if the Falcons are able to re-sign him and see exactly what his market is going to be. That's something to, to pay attention to moving forward. And we're going to start quarter number four, as we always do, trying to look forward and see what this game means for the Falcons. And really, there isn't a lot left in this season. There's only three games left. We have a game at home against the Lions. Then the Falcons go to Buffalo for a chilly one against the Bills. And then they wrap the season at home against the rival New Orleans Saints. Uh, This is obviously a real setback, right? We've talked about where this puts them in the kind of playoff process uh, something that I wrote uh, in my column about the playoffs and really the, the fan focus, I think, should shift a little bit towards areas where you've seen progress uh, to see if they can rebound. And if they happen to win three in a row, then you can go type in NFC playoff picture at the end, but probably not right now. And, and I think it's just about continued progress for the team in terms of understanding schemes. And it's also about trying to identify players that the Falcons are going to want back. There's so many guys who are on one-year deals. There are so many young players trying to show Terry Fontenot, this is not an off-season draft need for you. I can fill that role. I can do that job. 
Um, so this was obviously, I mean, there's no bones about it, Chris, huge setback here, but how, what does this mean moving forward? What should the, the Falcons fans kind of hone in on and how do you want to see this team uh, wrap up the, this season over the course of the last three games? Yeah, I think you put it pretty well. I mean, Arthur Smith talks a lot about in, in late games when they're down, when, they're, when they've lost this season or, or when they've been out of a game where he talks about, you know, this is when you learn a lot about guys. So this is this part of the season is where you learn a lot about guys and guys that are going to be here and, and who aren't going to be here. Like you said, this is a time for people to prove and for guys to prove that, you know, I, like you said, I, you don't this is not an offseason need for us. So I think um, going into this game, it will be important for, you know, the coaches, the staff, uh, scouts to, to to look at how guys approach these games, but also for fans too to look at the progress that's made and people that they can look to to stick around. So, so yeah, I think you encapsulated pretty well in terms of the focus shifting from maybe playoffs to, you know, the future. Tori, uh, what are you going to keep your eye on over the last three? Oh, I, I think there's a few things um, kind of what you were talking about, about like players that you can see still having a potential future with the Falcons that for one, um, but also looking for this team's identity. I feel as though I don't really know what it is yet. And I don't know if I thought that I would at this point, but I, I kind of was hoping that I would um, and, and kind of understanding that this is a process. This is not something that's going to happen overnight, which Arthur Smith has talked about a lot. Um, but being able to kind of get to the end of this season, regardless of what the record is, and to kind of be able to pull out, you know, this is what I think the Atlanta Falcons were in 2021. Like this was their identity. I think they turn like, I don't know. Sometimes I, I like to think like big picture and I think how you're going to like remember a team and, so I think for the next three games, it's about establishing kind of who you are, like who are the 2021 Atlanta Falcons, because the 2021 Atlanta Falcons, because of the way that the salary cap is right now and the way that it's going to change. I mean, this roster is going to change astronomically in the next probably three to four years. So who were the 2021 Falcons in the first year of the Terry Fontenot, Arthur Smith era? I know that's really, really big picture and not necessarily like, Oh, like just taking a look at the next three games. But I think that's kind of where my head's at right now. Yeah. I, I feel like I want to see, especially after this game, it was such a disappointment. There was the stakes were so high and the, and the difference between a win and a loss is so vast, right? Like it's dramatically different. So how do you respond to a situation like this? Are they going to keep fighting? Is, is Arthur Smith going to get the same practice tenor, the same buy-in, the same commitment moving forward that we've seen to get to this point? It's always a letdown when you, even though they're not mathematically eliminated and I'm not trying to say that 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 they are but what happens when you're disappointed i always like to it's a good character check i want to see how i, I want to see how they uh, respond i think it could help them if they get on a little run and build some positive momentum and do things that they haven't done to this point be the team with a winning record would be one they're gonna have that opportunity um, against buffalo when go on a winning streak that's other things that they haven't done and see exactly where this young foundation stands um, as we move forward. And that is also going to kind of wrap it up for us here at Falcons Final Whistle after, let's just call it what it is. It was a disappointing showing by the Atlanta Falcons. 31 to 13 was not what they wanted uh, for all the reasons that we have uh, described here. It did not work out well for them. It was a significant setback, uh, but Falcons Final Whistle, we're not stopping right now. We're going all the way to the end of the season. So do what you always do, right? Give us a five-star review or five-star rating, I'm sorry, and a review, subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or subscribe to the Atlanta Falcons YouTube channel. That would be awesome. Also do the same for Falcons Audible people. Great pod, uh, great guys in DJ Shockley, DJ Rackley, and Dave Archer. So thank you all for joining us, Chris and Tori from Santa Clara, me from the ATL, and we will talk to you again uh, after the Lions game at home on December 26th. So have a happy holiday to all of you, and we'll talk to you next week.